Federal Reserve. You know, for 18 years as, a, as an economist and educator, I have been teaching what you do. And, uh, and, it's, and so it's, it's almost um, neglectful on our part that we haven't asked you to come earlier, but I'm so glad that you could come and that we have the opportunity to talk with you. Um, I did apply to the New York Fed about a, a century ago, but um, things turned out okay. Um, I also want to thank the many VIPs in the room, and uh, will the Board of Trustees who serve Mercer and have served Mercer please rise and let us uh, celebrate you? And I have my very good friends, Bill Kilberg and Jim Skasavage, who serve on Stetson's Board of Visitors. Thank you for your service, gentlemen, and thank you for coming today. And I think it's, it's wonderful that Mercer can serve as a center for economic research, economics discussion, and a place just to convene uh, for the economists in middle Georgia. So welcome to all of you who are not from Mercer University but came to this event. Um, I have the privilege of welcoming uh, another member of the Federal Reserve Board who will introduce President Lockhart. Uh, Blake Lyons is here. Blake graduated from Mercer in the year 2000, which is also the year he joined the Atlanta Fed. In a relatively short time, he's now Vice President for Human Resources for the 6th District, which spans portions of six states. Big job, Blake. Well done. Um, please come and join me up here and uh, welcome our distinguished guest. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. It's a, it's a great honor to be back uh, at my collegiate home here at Mercer. I, I must say, uh, just out of the gate, uh, how proud I am of my education here at Mercer. And as I look at the campus behind us, uh, things have changed a little bit uh, in that short period of time I haven't been here, right? Uh, but I'm very proud as I, as I continue to watch the evolution of our programs, the facilities, the outstanding faculty. Uh, and obviously the execution on a long-term campus improvement plan. Just uh, fantastic. Appreciate the opportunity to be back, and I'm more and more proud of my affiliation every day. So thank you for having me. I also very uh, fortunate to have the opportunity to introduce a gentleman I have the great privilege of working with on a regular basis, Mr. Dennis Lockhart, our president and our chief executive officer. Uh, Dennis has been our president and CEO since March of 2007. Uh, he's our 14th president and CEO. Uh, in that capacity, Dennis is responsible for all aspects of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta's activities including monetary policy, banking supervision and regulation, payment services operations, and he obviously sits on the Federal Open Market Committee. Uh, prior to becoming a central banker, uh, Dennis has had many uh, positions as a senior leader and as a business executive and also uh, as a faculty member at several institutions of higher learning. Uh, Dennis has uh, served as a faculty member at Georgetown, as an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University, uh, from a business perspective, uh, Dennis uh, has held various se senior leadership positions. Uh, he was a managing partner of the private equity firm of Zephyr Management based in New York with activity in Africa and Latin America. He spent 13 years at Heller Financial, where he was the president of their international group, uh, which had activities in finance and banking in Latin America, Europe, and Asia. Uh, Dennis also held various senior leadership positions in uh, what is now Citigroup, had the opportunity to work domestically and internationally. I had the opportunity to work in the Middle East, serving in Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Iran, also served in Greece. I was a senior officer, senior officer of corporate banking in the U.S. and the Southeast uh, for Citigroup as well. He also served our country as an officer in the U.S. Marine Corps Reserve. On top of his very impressive uh, <clears throat> career, uh, Dennis is also very, very involved in the community. Uh, he's the, the director of the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. He chairs the Midtown Alliance. He also chairs the Carter Center's Board of Counselors, and is a former chair of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. He's a trustee of Agnes Scott College and of the Atlanta International School, uh, and he also is a uh, advisory member uh, at Georgia State University. Dennis is a 
native of Bakersfield, California, received his undergraduate degree at Stanford University, a graduate degree at Johns Hopkins University, and also attended the uh, senior executive program at, at MIT Sloan School of Management. Dennis is a, a great leader and a wonderful person to work with, great leader for the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, also a great leader in the Federal Reserve System, and I think you're really going to enjoy his remarks today. So join me in welcome our president, uh, Dennis Lockhart. Well, Blake, thank you very much. Uh, I should say that Mercer should be very proud of Blake Lyons. He's, he's a, one of our best, an up-and-comer in the Federal Reserve System. And I'm saying all this so that you'll stay with us for a few more years and don't, won't get recruited away by the bankers in the room who might be already slipping, uh, slipping you their cards or whatever. Um, well, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, particularly with this backdrop. You know, I, I'm a football fan, so if I just turn around every once in a while to see what's going on, you'll understand. It's, uh, it reminds me of a time when I, I spoke in the backdrop was a lake with, with sailboats on a beautiful summer day. And I had to compete with people who, I, I swear, they were looking over my shoulder <laughs> and had this sort of longing look in their, in their eyes, uh, you know, waiting for their, <clears throat> their chance to get out of the room and on to that. Um, I've been, uh, I should say, I've been worrying about uh, speaking in Macon for several weeks now. Um, a few weeks ago, I, I was a witness to a, really an amazing concert in Atlanta that involved musicians, uh, all, almost all of whom had Macon connections. Chuck Lavelle organized, uh, he was the organizer and the lead performer um, of a, a night of um, rip-roaring southern rock uh, that included uh, Robert McDuffie, the superb concert violinist who's Conservatory is here at Mercer, um, Greg Allman of the Allman Brothers, and the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. <clears throat> One of the most appreciated numbers uh, was Chuck Lavelle's rendition of Low Down Dirty Dog. <laughs> and you really should have been there. Uh, since then, as I said, I've been worrying about my gig here at uh, Mercer. <clears throat> Uh, a central banker talking about monetary policy and the economy. I'm wondering if you're going to tell your friends you should have been there, or, or maybe you should have been there to hear that low-down, dirty dog <clears throat> from the Federal Reserve. The pressure's on, I guess. Um, so here's my playlist uh, for uh, this afternoon. I plan to talk about the country's uh, current economic situation and the outlook for 2014. I'll describe the positioning, if you will, of the Federal Open Market Committee's uh, current monetary policy in relation to the outlook that I'll describe. And I will spend uh, quite a bit of time discussing the Federal Open Market Committee's forward guidance about interest rate policy. My focus on forward guidance uh, reflects its growing importance as a policy tool of the Fed. Indeed, we're now in a period in which effective communication between your central bank and the public, including participants in financial markets, presents uh, heightened challenges for, for us policymakers. I'll elaborate on that point in a moment. I should say, as always, my comments are my personal views and may not reflect uh, the views of my colleagues in the Federal Reserve System or on the Federal Open Market Committee. <clears throat> so let me begin uh, with my views on the current state of the economy and the outlook. The economy seemed to move to a higher growth track in the second half of 2013. As the data now stand, and I, I say now because we, we don't, or I say now stand because we don't yet have the final number for the fourth quarter, the economy expanded in the second half at an annual rate of 3.6%. This is the current estimate of real GDP, that is gross domestic product growth, 
That's growth net of inflation. So 3.6% in the second half of 2013. That's about one and a half percentage points above the economy's average growth uh, since the end of the recession. <clears throat> Mixed incoming data on economic, economic activity in December and January have raised concerns about whether the economy has traction at this faster growth rate. There appears to have been a slowdown. Weather effects may very well have dampened retail sales, auto sales, housing starts, manufacturing activities, and of course, transportation, among others. Weather is also likely to affect the February employment report, which will receive March 7th. As a result, the current quarter is difficult to read. Uh, difficult to read as an indication of the most likely story for the full year 2014, and I would say the first part of 2015 as well. The recent mixed data could be just a temporary thing, as the weather explanation suggests, or something more fundamental could be going on. I'm tracking the numbers carefully at the moment, but I, but I, and I think it's actually too early to draw a conclusion. Even though the first quarter of this year may turn out to be soft, for now I am looking through the recent information to a full year of sustained higher growth. In that sense, my outlook remains optimistic for the full year. I expect real gross domestic product growth between two and a half and 3% for 2014. I remain hopeful for the full year because uh, I think the fundamentals underpinning economic performance are notably improved compared to a year ago and earlier. Factors that earlier impeded uh, consumer spending and business investment have relented. Uncertainty about fiscal arrangements, for example, that it's controlled by Congress, that uncertainty is reduced. Business and consumer confidence is higher. Risks of financial instability associated with problems in Europe have abated. The recent spell of emerging market turbulence has quieted and the U.S. equity markets seem to have firmed. While conditions have improved, substantial gaps exist between where we are and where we want to be or ought to be economically. Inflation is currently running around 1%, depending on the measure that's used. The FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, would like the ongoing rate of, of, of inflation to be closer to 2%. This is considered a healthier rate of inflation for the longer term. At 2%, there is less risk of slipping into a cycle of economic contraction, and at the same time, price changes over time are not significant enough to distort the planning of households and businesses. There's also a sizable employment gap between today's 6.6% rate of unemployment and estimates of full employment. We rely on a quantitative measure of unemployment to convey both quantitative and qualitative dimensions of the country's work picture. The FOMC's most recent estimate of full employment using the official unemployment rate as a gauge, ranges from 5.2 to 5.8 percent. So quantitatively, that's what the committee believes full employment is. In my view, that difference of about 1 percent between today's rate and the committee's estimate of full employment may uh, understate the distance that is still to be traveled. Even with these caveats, my bottom line is that the economy is in a better place today than a year ago and before. 
I maintain that the outlook is positive and in terms of, the, of its basics, much improved. I'd like now to turn to an explanation of where the Fed's monetary policy stands. For all of last year and since September 2012, the Fed pursued a program of what we call large-scale asset purchases, pu uh, publicly uh, known as quantitative easing. Last December, the FOMC decided to reduce those purchases by, from $85 billion per month to $75 billion per month. In January, the committee brought those purchases down by another $10 billion a month to $65 billion. These decisions were based on the economic progress achieved since the recovery began in June of 2009, an improvement in employment conditions, and importantly, the positive outlook for continued progress. As long as the outlook remains solid, and does not deviate dramatically from the path we believe it's on, I would expect the tapering of asset purchases to continue over the balance of this year. I expect the asset purchase program to be completely wound down by the fourth quarter of this year. In our public remarks over much of last year, my colleagues and I stressed a couple of very important messages. First, even with the phase out of asset purchases, the basic stance of monetary policy remains, this is Fed speak, highly accommodative. Highly accommodative. To translate, the committee intends to keep interest rates very low. The second message was that the QE program, the quantitative easy program, uh, and the Fed's policy interest rate target are two separate tools of policy. Consequently, we can wind down the asset purchases, a program that was meant to provide temporary supplemental oomph to, uh, to the low interest rate policy, and at the same time preserve the accommodative positioning of policy appropriate for the reality of our economic situation. The financial markets, particularly participants in bond markets, seem to have heard these messages. In the aftermath of the tapering decision in early December, longer term interest rates did not rise and have not risen since then to any great extent. I think the transition, transition currently underway has gone pretty well and communication with the public and markets on this aspect of policy was rather effective. That claim on my part sets up my next topic and that's the role of forward guidance about interest rate policy as an actual policy tool. As most of you know, the, the FOMC sets a target for the federal funds rate. This is the rate at which banks with surplus reserves at the central bank lend to banks short of reserves on an overnight basis. This one interest rate, which the Fed can more or less control, serves as the foundation of the whole maturity spectrum of interest rates and interest yields that matter to Main Street America. In that sense, the Fed's policy interest rate decisions set the tone for broader financial conditions, tight or easy, as they say. And importantly, participants in longer-term bond markets anticipate the future path of the Fed's policy rate in determining the rates charged for car loans and home mortgages today, for instance. The federal funds uh, rate target, the FOMC's policy rate, has been at effectively zero for more than five years. It would not be possible to push it lower 
even if economic conditions call for lower rates. Quantitative easing, the purchase of longer-term securities, was a way to exert further downward pressure uh, on rates in the absence of the ability, in practical terms, to set the policy rate below zero. These have been unusual times since 2008, requiring unusual measures. Now that the program of asset purchases is being wound down, and I'll repeat my view appropriately in my view, more of the work of maintaining an accommodative environment falls to Fed communication in general and forward rate guidance in particular. To put emphasis on that point, let me quote from a speech last spring by Janet Yellen, the Fed's new chair. Janet said, the Federal Reserve's ability to influence economic conditions today depends crucially on its ability to shape expectations of the future, specifically by helping the public understand how it, that is the, the Fed, intends to conduct policy over time and what the likely implications of those actions will be for economic conditions. Indeed, monetary policy, modern monetary policy is aimed at influencing economic outcomes through what we call the expectations channel. Expectations drive decisions by consumers, households, businesses, and investors throughout the economy. These decisions taken together have a big influence on the trajectory of the economy. So what we at the Fed say we intend to do as regards interest rate policy should have a big impact on what happens. I would argue that under the current circumstances, forward guidance about the direction of rate policy is more than just commentary, it is a policy tool itself. And for the period ahead, the next couple of years at least, forward guidance may be the lead policy tool arguably the most potent method we have for influencing financial conditions and economic results. Let me repeat that, that point using slightly different words. Getting the economy we want depends increasingly on the ability of the public and participants in financial markets to hear, understand, and believe FOMC communications about the direction of monetary policy and the intended financial conditions tied to policy decisions. Today, the central question that forward guidance addresses and the predominant focus of financial market participants is the timing of liftoff. Liftoff is code for the date of the first increase of the policy interest rate. I'll lay out what the FOMC has said recently on this subject. A little over a year ago, in December 2012, the FOMC set an unemployment rate of 6.5% as a threshold for consideration of liftoff. The unemployment rate has been falling rapidly toward that 6.5% threshold and today stands at 6.6%. Its decline has been faster than many expected, and the reasons have been more complicated than just unemployed people getting jobs. Labor economists follow the intensity of flows underlying employment statistics, such as unemployment and labor force participation, two examples of uh, employment statistics. At any given time, there are flows of employed and unemployed people into and out of the labor force. You may be aware that some of the decline in the unemployment rate has coincided with falling, falling labor force participation. About half of the fall in participation, 
can be explained by demographic trends, that is, baby boomers choosing to retire. At the same time, a non-trivial portion of the decline seems to be associated with a rising share of prime age workers who are not in the labor force. Some of these individuals are categorized as marginally attached to the labor force. They are available for work, but not actively looking for a job in the last month. They represent what you might call a shadow workforce of people not actually counted among the unemployed. A subset of the marginally attached population is classified as discouraged workers. These are people, um, these, these people are not looking for a job because for any number of reasons, they do not think there is work out there for them. I should also mention the, that uh, the people who have a job and so are counted as officially employed could be working part-time and often say that they would like to work more hours or have a full-time job. All of these categories of what I call underutilized labor resources or underutilized human capital, if you will, grew during the recession and have stayed elevated throughout the uh, recovery. As a result, I often point to what might be called qualitative weakness underlying the quantitative progress associated with the drop in unemployment to 6.6%. I would argue that the official unemployment rate overstates progress to date. At the same time, the low readings of inflation are hard to square with at least the recent stronger growth. I had these concerns in mind when I supported the FOMC's decision to adjust its guidance in December of last year the last December meeting. The committee then said it anticipates that the policy rate will remain at zero well past the 6.5% threshold. Further, in its official statement following the FOMC meeting in January, the committee said, and this is a quote, highly, the highly ac accommodative stance of monetary policy will remain appropriate for a considerable period of time after the asset purchase program ends. There are two reasons for this guidance. One is the weakness in employment data that underlies the improving unemployment rate. The other is the weakness of inflation readings. I think both factors should be equally important considerations in determining how long to keep the policy rate at its current level. In my Reserve Bank's most recent official forecast, we predicted liftoff of the policy rate in the second half of 2015. And I remain comfortable with this forecast. Even with the intense interest in the date of liftoff, I expect that the work of forward guidance will not be finished just with the first increase of the Fed funds rate. I expect communication and forward guidance to be especially demanding requirements for the FOMC and for that matter for other central banks going forward. Let me summarize my main points today. I see forward guidance on the Fed's policy rate as the lead monetary policy tool currently and for the foreseeable future. It is a challenge for policymakers. The central policy question is the timing of liftoff of the Fed's funds rate. The key criteria for a liftoff decision are affirming of inflation to near the FOMC's target of 2% and both a quantitative and qualitative closing of the employment gap. So, that's the lowdown on monetary policy as I see it at this juncture. 
I don't know how to use the rest of the song's title. It would just get me in trouble. So I will now entertain your questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> So many of the central banks around the world are, are facing the same zero bond interest rate problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, a central bank like Bank of Canada is also thinking about or considering that they should set their targets in a rather analytical way rather than quantitative way. Now, is, the, is USA pursuing similar kind of strategy or could you elaborate on that? How would the forward guidance be different from what is being currently mm -hmm. pursued? Or how is it similar to the policy that uh, Alan Greenspan era used to pursue? Well, the, I, I, first, you've got to be very careful not to get ahead of the committee. And therefore, not to, I'm not speaking for the committee. I'm just giving my own opinion of what the critical considerations are. But there's a, 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 a let's say, a tug of war between uh, expressing for guidance in quantitative terms, which are typically going to be v much easier for the public to follow. For example, the 6.5% threshold was something that everyone in this room could, could once a month at least tune into and kind of, kind of have a sense of how close we, we were to it and therefore how soon interest rates would rise. Uh, depending on quantitative versus either a broader range of quantitative indicators or something more qualitative that doesn't, it isn't, isn't so concrete. And uh, let me just say that, you know, that's what I'm grappling with at the moment as one participant in the FOMC. What's the right way to do that? We wanna, we wanna balance, uh, you know, the kind of communications that can actually help people plan and actually give them a basis for making decisions that help the economy um, while at the same time not so completely boxing ourselves in to a quantitative interpreted as trigger kind of thing uh, uh, that we really had, don't have the flexibility to respond to how the economy really evolves. So finding that balance between quantitative and qualitative and between a single uh, indicator and perhaps a range of indicators that, to me, is the policy question that we have to grapple with right now. Sasha. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about the unemployment rate. Uh, we know <clears throat> when you talk about inflation, uh, you pick which inflation rate you will target. So my question is, is FOMC considering or should the Fed watchers pay attention to U6 unemployment rate, which does measure marginally attached workers, uh, involuntarily part-timers, and has been much more stable than the U3, which is the 6.5%. And it, in a quantitative way, reflects some of the concerns that you are, that you are making. So I, I imagine you are paying attention to it. Is it likely that in some future that might become the target uh, that, that should be watched? Or would you recommend that the Fed watchers also pay attention to it? Well, it... it um, the, the use of a different indicator is a possibility and it's an indication. Just to educate everybody in the room, the Bureau of Labor Statistics puts out U1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And the official unemployment rate that we're all familiar with, currently at 6.6%, is U3. Um, that does not address marginally attached workers. It does not address even part-time for economic reasons. So, and I said in my remarks, I think it may overstate the progress we've made in, in employment in the country. And in that sense, it's perhaps not the ideal way of measuring uh, how, we're, uh, how well we're doing in an employment sense. Um, it's possible that we could look at, at a, a different official level. Now, yesterday, uh, and partly in preparation for this meeting, uh, we did a review of exactly how to think about that. And it's not the, l uh, historically, there has always been a gap between U3 and U6, as you would expect. So what may be different is the margin of difference between 
what it normally would be and what it is today. That then gets a little complicated to communicate. I didn't do a very good job of communicating it two seconds ago. So it's a little bit hard to communicate that you're really looking at a difference of a difference to determine um, how things are really uh, developing. So um, I think I should at least give equal time to s some other approach that maybe doesn't use one of the U's, but uses a range of employment um, statistics that as a group can give a, a pretty accurate picture of the health of the labor markets. That's sort of my preference. Hi. Um, I guess to me the most important question is why haven't we seen inflation? And that's something that's been puzzling me and trying to explain. Um, now there are some signs that we may get inflation in the, in the future. I mean, the monetary base has quadrupled over the last five years. In any other country, that would have been hyperinflation uh, automatically. Um, we haven't passed the 1% uh, threshold. And, uh, and that's something difficult to explain. Now, we have exported some of that inflation to other countries, right? Because banks here have been sitting on the money or have been buying U.S. Treasury securities. Uh, so I see signs of troubling, you know, symptoms. For example, do we have a bubble on treasury securities? Or all that money that has been flowing to Brazil, to Indonesia, is going to come back and at that time hit us with inflation. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, you ask a, a big and important question. And what's on your mind is also on the mind of a lot of economists, including some of my staff, who are, think it's puzzling that we can have this five years of recovery, even at a relatively slow pace of growth. We can have a pickup in growth in the second half. And yet, at the same time, we just don't see any inflation to speak of. Um, generally, you would expect inflation to be associated with, with growth, and consequently, uh, we think we should have seen some indication of at least rising inflation rate, and we haven't. Um, does that suggest that we're misreading the underlying strength of the economy? It's, 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 it's possible. Or uh, in economic circles, as many of you in the room know, you know, you could venture a position that is practically sacrilege, and that is somehow Milton Friedman was wrong. <laughs> And inflation is not, at the end of the day, enti entirely a monetary phenomenon. I'm not going to go there. I would end, I'd be tarred and feathered and, and, and ridden out of town on a rail to make that kind of claim. Uh, but he was talking in broad, long-term terms. And for the short term, we have as practically as accommodative a stance of policy as you can imagine. And yet, the prices are subdued. Uh, my outlook is that we will gradually see a, a, a rise in, in inflation that will be associated with a continuation of pretty decent growth and um, along the lines we saw in the second half. And I simply say that if we don't see a, um, an indication in inflation numbers of that uh, continued growth of the economy, if we don't see that pickup, then um, there may be something more fundamental at work that we need to understand better. And at the, at the moment, we, you know, we're somewhat puzzled by, by, by what we've seen so far. Yes, last Susan, last question for you. Uh, Bitcoin. Ah. Uh, Well, um, I, again, I don't, I'm not speaking for the Fed, particularly on the subject of Bitcoin. Uh, there, there is no official position. Um, I've been watching this carefully and, and because it's sort of an interesting 
experiment and some of the people associated with it are colorful people. <laughs> so it's kind of fun to watch and to see what happens. There are some questions that are being raised related to its, the Bitcoin's involvement with potentially illicit activity or with money laundering. Uh, there is no regulation yet, but you know there, there may have to be at some stage on it. I think it's just an interesting little experiment to watch. Um, in the earlier session with the students, I had to say that the students might n not get this reference, but I think in this room you're all old enough to get it. Um, I recently had the same question and I said, to me it's the Esperanto of m monetary assets. <laughs> and you remember back in the 60s when someone invented this new language that was going to bring world peace because we were all going to speak Esperanto and nothing ever happened. And uh, a reporter tweeted that out, and so I was waiting for hate mail from the Bitcoin enthusiasts out there and uh, have not received any yet. Uh, my position is uh, it's interesting to watch. It's an experiment. Um, it will, in my mind, is a, very unlikely to become a substitute for the dollar. Um, it is a, just simply another payments mechanism, and let's watch it and see how it develops. It could be a flash in the pan. It could be something that sticks for uh, for uh, forever. So I just don't know. But it's not keeping me up at night. I want to thank you thank so you. much thank you. for coming today on behalf of Nelson. I hope you have enjoyed today's session. This is certainly what I hope as the new dean of the business school that we get to do more of in the future. Uh, and again, to all of you from the Federal Reserve Bank today, I was going to say board, from the Federal Reserve Bank today, um, not only do you do what we teach, but it really, really matters. So thank you for your service, and thank you so much for coming. We are adjourned. <laughs>